Hi, I'm Melissa Simpson, and I'm here with the International Left Hand Bath Consortium. And I'm here with Toby Chapel, who's going to be a presenter at the Left Hand Path Consortium. So, Toby, I'm glad you were able to make it. Thank you for coming. Thanks for having me. Not a problem, not a problem. So, um, you're going to be speaking as a presenter at the Left Hand mm -hmm. Path Consortium. And uh, I was curious, what, what are you going to be speaking about? I'm going to be speaking about uh, the idea of story wisdom and how it relates to the Left Hand Path. So, story wisdom is a phrase that originally comes from H.P. Lovecraft in the story The Haunter of the Dark. There was a particular sect that he wrote about that they were the disliked and unorthodox uh, starry wisdom sect who were in contact with something that lived beyond the stars that they were deeply concerned with and were looking to draw forth his influence down to, down to earth. The approach that I take towards it and many others that, that I work with also take towards it is uh, much less of the sort of the horror movie aspect of it but much more about what it is that we can learn from reflection on the night sky. Mm -hmm. As early humans began to look up, to began to notice patterns, the ones that were less afraid to be away from others, that were less afraid to be in the dark alone, that were less afraid to spend their time contemplating what was going up, up above them, whether than being so deeply concerned just with earthly concerns, mm -hmm. but began to notice that there were patterns, that things happened in certain ways and in certain orders. And as they sought to understand this in the limited way that they could, this changed greatly the way that they thought about themselves in relation to it. And so in a modern sense, the story of wisdom is about the pursuit of using the contemplation of the night sky as a mirror in which you can see yourself by its reflection, by the, the, the meaning and the symbology and the significance that you place upon the things that you see, and that what it teaches you about how the cycles of human culture are governed, for example, the, you know, the turning of the tides, um, the flooding of the Nile River um, every year, uh, things like this, that the people that understand how to read what's in the sky and to connect it with what they do and how it affects the world around them are the ones that have more power in order to get the most from that relationship. Now this is very unrelated to astrology. You know, astrology actually is one of the oldest sort of, of the black arts. Right. Um, during a time when the lines between astrology and astronomy were very blurry indeed. So what I'm talking about here is, is definitely not um, anything akin to astrology. It's more akin to how um, early humans saw themselves in relation to what they saw above. Uh, and how this governed their thinking and how this suggested certain modes of thought to them. Uh, an example I, I can give about this is uh, in the early uh, pharaonic dynasties in Egypt, um, starting around the second dynasty, you would have a ceremony that was connected with the laying of any building that the pharaoh participated in, as well as one of the priests of the goddess Seshet, who was the goddess of temple records and of temple writing. Uh, there was a a uh, foundation laying ceremony called the stretching of the cord, during which the pharaoh uh, recited uh, an incantation that affirmed that that he had been informed of what the stars were doing, and that he is affirming that the orientation that the stars have suggested to him are true with the foundation of the building that's being laid. You can see kind of shades of this in the as above, so below idea of hermetic science, um, but more importantly, what you see is that the the idea that human patterns are somehow related to the divine pattern seen in the stars above was a significant shaping mechanism to their culture. It was a significant uh, suggester of things that those who had the, the knowledge and the will to contemplate them might do to reflect upon themselves. Very fascinating, very fascinating. I'm sure that everyone will enjoy that. And of course, uh, if you are planning to attend the International Left Hand Path Consortium, again, like I said, Toby Chapel will be speaking, and uh, it is going to be April 8th, 9th, and 10th of 2016. So please buy your tickets, and uh, it'll be a very fun event. So um, now, you've been to the occult for a while, or mm -hmm. the occult path for a very long time. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, what brought you into the occult? 
Well, I've been fascinated with the strange and the mysterious for as long as I can remember. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, some of my earliest memories are about kind of looking up at the sky and you know wondering what those things are. Um, your early memories of you know being woken up in the middle of the night by my parents to see a lunar eclipse and things like that. I spent a lot of time gazing through the telescope. Um, but my my kind of overt path towards uh, the the study of the esoteric could really kind of be summed up something like this. You know, teenage metalhead in the late '80s in the Deep South become learns about Satanism. Imagines all of his bands or all of his favorite bands are secretly in league with the Prince of Darkness. <laughs> then discovers that for maybe you know 99.99% of them it's just a marketing gimmick. But there might be something to the Satan thing anyway. Then discovers that the the truth goes even deeper and further and more mysterious than the kind of ever imagined before. So uh, from from that that sort of launched me into uh, in my college years to begin to explore kind of what what is there that's beyond just the, the apparent choices that are being offered for uh, spirituality, for self-development, for understanding what the world is beyond just the, the materialist aspects of, of scientific thought. Um, I, I did what was probably fairly typical of, of the time, um, this is sort of in the days of the, the early access to the internet as well, of kind of exploring around, seeing what other people were doing, seeing which things resonated, seeing which things were obviously full of it. Um, seeing which things were, um, you know, saw one too many events of price movies. You know, you, you run the whole gamut if you're really kind of deeply exploring these things. Um, so for a, a time, I uh, ended up, uh, after trying out various other things, ended up in the OTO for a while. Um, there were some aspects of it that I found interesting. Uh, my resonance with Crowley's work as what I understood at the time of being the left hand path, uh, but began to sort of see that there was a bit more to it than that and it was not quite what I was looking to get out of it. Um, and then later, uh, probably around that time, also uh, began to learn about the Temple of Set. Uh, so from there, in, by, by virtue of becoming exposed to writers like Don Webb, um, his um, Uncle Setnack's Essential Guide to the Left Hand Path was a very formative work, which is interesting because it was not written to be a sort of a book about SETI and thought or about the Temple of Set. Rather, it was written to be sort of a, a general handbook about what is the left-hand path in modern terms without having to be so concerned about the historic aspects of it, although it did delve into the history somewhat, but really about what does it mean in this day and age? What does it mean to differentiate oneself against the symbol systems and the belief systems that are prevalent in the world today? Um, and from that began to think that this might be something I would be interested in, that the, these people seem to have a bit more of an idea of how this works that's more resonant with what I'm kind of feeling is my, my path. Um, and so from there, uh, then affiliated with the temple, um, have been part of the temple for uh, about 15 years or so at this point. Um, now, of course, the, the, the path doesn't end there. It's even within an organization like the temple of said, it's still a very individualistic path. Um, there is no, you must believe this and this and this, sort of dogmatic approach. Mm -hmm. The only real dogma, if you if you had to really pin it down, might be something along the lines of uh, becoming is good. Anything that leads to becoming is therefore good. It doesn't have to be much more in-depth in than that. The ways in which you go about it are really sort of, you do the things that resonate most with you um, and with the people that resonate most with you. or make it into a completely solitary path if you wish. There's no one right way to do it. It's far less structured than something like the OTO or Freemasonry or, or things like that. Um, so speaking at the Left Hand Path Conference is gonna be rather interesting because I'm gonna be talking about a topic, the story of wisdom that we discussed um, earlier, uh, that's uh, something that's, that there are certain people within the temple who are very interested in it, certain people who don't, couldn't care less about it. But, but like many, many aspects of it, it's not something that is only useful within a context of Egyptian thought, like the example I gave earlier, or, um, or within a organization, a specific organization. It's really a more general thing that I think is very formative in terms of what the left-hand path was, that first differentiation that people began to see against that, I'm not like the rest of you people. I, I, I look at the world differently. Mm -hmm. I, I have more of my path. What you're doing is cool, but I need to do my own thing, exactly. sort of idea. Which is a very brave and potentially dangerous thing to do, especially in a tribal society. 
Mm -hmm. uh, there's traditional societies are very based around needing to work well with your fellow members, needing to trust them, to trust that you all have the same aims, the same goals, the same thoughts about many things. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there is room for individuality, of course, um, but to, but to say I need to do my own thing is a can be a very dangerous thing. Mm -hmm. Now, schools of, of thought that have explored that over over the millennia, you know, sometimes they're looked upon as good things, like in the the um, Plato's Academy, um, many of the priesthoods of ancient Egypt, etc. Sometimes it's been a much more dangerous thing to, to, to do. Um, you know, try being a, an alchemist in the Middle Ages and let it get out and see how far you get. Absolutely. So the, it's, it's possible to explore this extreme path to individuality in a, in a way that's not threatening to your, to your own society. But it's difficult to do so, and it requires the highest ethics. It requires being above approach on things that may, may be questionable. Mm -hmm. It's it's part of how you kind of um, you know, insulate yourself against. Well, you th you think that because I follow this path that I do you know this and this and this and this, except I I don't. And you can see that my actions that I'm an upstanding member of society. I pay my taxes. I pay the speed limit. <laughs> you know the, the, right. these. Uh, these things, so it, it's it ends up with that very interesting dichotomy between antinomianism as literally meaning against the law, and yet advocating you know being a a very ethical member of of the society you find yourself in. So the way to think of that is more of the antinomian being you know a spiritual criminal in a sense. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Now I see that you have these books on the table. And these lights, you brought them with you, thank you very much. And uh, through Dark Angles, Don Webb, and of course Joseph Campbell, The Hero with a Thousand Faces, and what is the other book? Um, Herman Hesse, it's uh, The Glass Bead Game. Ah, I see, interesting. So now, why did you bring these books with you? Well, one of the aspects of the left-hand path that's very important is to find the aesthetic that resonates with you. Mm -hmm. For some people, say for example, you grew up on you know, 1930s era universal horror films, you, know, you might find more resonance with uh, you know, Bela Lugosi's Dracula or Karloff's Frankenstein, these kind of things. Um, or you may find that that type of imagery doesn't do as much for you as, as other things do. So. Uh, when you asked me to, or invited me to bring a few things along, uh, I, I kind of thought, thought, what would it be like if, if I were just having a normal discussion in a round table with other, with other friends um, on some of these topics, and what kinds of things might just be around because it's what I'm reading at the moment, or, or just part of the general aesthetic. So when I, when I chose to bring um, the, I didn't go to a lot of effort to pick specifically three books. I kind of grabbed three books, just the first three that kind of jumped out at me. Mm -hmm. um, so the Campbell book is, is actually a fairly easy one to talk about. Joseph Campbell um, is fairly well known to most people, uh, mainly because of uh, both because of his books and through the series of interviews that he did later in his life with Bill Moyer that were aired on PBS. Um, Campbell himself considered himself to be a follower of the Left Hand Path, uh, as he understood it, uh, and his definition of that is very much in resonance with my own, I think. Mm -hmm. And Campbell's focus was on mythology and specifically on the heroic archetypes and what they could teach okay. us as models for being, models for the individual to, to fulfill him or herself as mm -hmm. much as possible. Um, and so what he seeks to do is th throughout the myths that he analyzed, he looks to, have to see how these became exemplars that could be held forth of the way that one might most effectively interact with any particular uh, tribal society or uh, particular uh, uh, pre-Christian uh, society. So uh, that one I think is a very important one because it connects to the idea that storytelling is an innate aspect of the experience of being fully human. I can and see that too. Mm -hmm. With, with myths being the stories in a pre in a pre literate society would have been the way that you had to pass on this these are our values this is what we believe in mm -hmm. this is what makes one great this is one makes one not so great um, and Campbell was able to see lots of commonality between different myths 
he wasn't trying to say that they were all aspects of the same idea or that this culture stole it from this culture, but that, uh, but the, over time, the fundamentals of what it means to be an exemplar of a, of a human can be seen in the way that they conceive of their gods. Uh, so, the, brought that one for, for that reason. Um, the Glass Bead Game is uh, one of my favorite novels um, from one of my, my favorite writers. Um, the, glass bead game. the thrust of The Glass Bead Game, it's, uh, it was the last major novel that Hesse wrote, um, and it's mainly about a particular province that's been set aside in, it's never quite specified, but it's, but it's probably in Germany, um, that in the 25th century, that is a place that's wholly devoted to learning. So the people that have been they're admitted to this place uh, are um, exempt from many of the things that one normally has to do to get by in the world. They're they're provided for effectively, and in exchange, they concentrate almost entirely on uh, products of the mind and how um, and it's specifically in, in the titular glass bead game. Um, the relationship between ideas, the relationship between aspects of history, the relationship between different parts of science and art, and how they all interconnect through uh, being part of the tapestry of human experience. Uh, the, the main character is one who eventually rises to become the sort of the grandmaster of uh, that game, the glass bead game, mm -hmm. uh, which is one of the most important positions in, the, in this province. Um, but then ultimately decides that they've retreated so deeply into only being concerned with the products of the mind that they're losing something that they've, they've now begun to lose something essential about what it means to be a fully developed and fully formed human. Mm -hmm. um, and eventually he decides to, to, to leave it because he, he sees it as having gone too far. He wants to he wants to reconnect with that aspect of himself that he lost when he was taken from his family, when he swore service to the, to the order itself. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, in addition to being very compelling writing, it's also a bit of a kind of like a warning of the what happens if you if you become so deeply ingrained in your own subjective universe of uh, working with uh, working with magic, working with with thought, working with, with knowledge. That you can become so divorced from the rest of reality that it's now it's now a problem. You, know, you you arrive at things that are true, but only true in your own head. Uh, so it's sort of like a, a warning in a sense as well. So you have uh, through Dark Ages by John Webb. Tell me about that. So to to really talk about that, uh, when I go back to something I said earlier, um, I mentioned Uncle Setnack's Essential Guide to the Left Hand Path, mm -hmm. um, and which was being one of the gateways that sort of introduced me to the wider world of uh, possibilities for my own becoming. Um, before I can really talk about um, Through Dark Angles, I actually need to talk a little bit about what the, these lamps are and why, why I brought those. Um, within the early Church of Satan, there was a very distinctly Germanic tinge to many of its workings. Um, LaVey was fairly enamored with um, German Expressionist film. Mm -hmm. um, he was enamored with um, the, the politics of power that sort of arose within the Third Reich. He, um, being himself of Jewish extraction, he was, of course, not very enamored with what, how far they took it, but was able to sort of extract some of the, the rudimentary things going on in Germany between the 20s and the 40s that were worth kind of bringing forward. Um, so in typical LaVey fashion, he you claimed uh, perhaps deeper origins for some of the things that, that he wrote about than were really there, but there was a tinge of truth to them. One of the specific rites that um, was very uh, potently done within the, uh, the Church of Satan and then has continued on within the, uh, the Temple of Set and, and its order of the trapezoid was the, the DEV, the De Elektrischen uh which is German for the Electrical Preludes. Um, think, if you think about um, the animation scene for Ultima Futura in uh, the film Metropolis, uh, if you think about uh, the animation scene of the monster in uh, the classic Frankenstein with, with Karloff, okay. this idea of mad labs, you know, the mad scientist you know, playing with the very fabric of the universe was something that was very near and dear to LaVey's heart, both aesthetically and in terms of what he was trying to do. So the DEV, um, 
was very strongly influenced by by those those two things as well as um, there was a a writer of kind of mysteries and um, sort of occult novels called William Hope Hodgson um, who had a a psychic detective type character, a cult detective character, um, that um, also provides some of the imagery that, that shows up in the DEV. So in the DEV you, you have, uh, he wrote about it as the right of the is to be, what is, what is to be done, what is to become, that you have uh, everyone concentrating their desires that they wish to shape the world in, funneling it through a central person um, you know, called the celebrant within this, who then um, gathers up the energy that's being released and then focuses it outward. All the while going around you have mirrors, you have lights, you have um, devices that ionize the air and create interesting atmospheres in the chamber. Jacob's ladders, Van der Graaff generators, things like this. It would be very chaotic and, and very dangerous if done correctly. Mm -hmm. You know, you touch a Jacob's ladder that's uh, more powerful than a, you know, th than you want and you're going to regret it if not actually die in the process. So um, he regarded it as one of his very most potent rights. And so this idea of mad laughs is something that I'm very much uh, into, very much um, a, a connoisseur of. Um, and it even filters into things like my musical work, which we'll probably talk about at some point, I'm sure. Um, so one of the sort of the props, I guess, I kind of go back to this idea of finding the right aesthetic for your, for your work along the left-hand left path. Um, includes uh, these. They're actually from Ikea. They, they don't make them anymore. Right. Um, they're essentially a column of blue LEDs and some acrylic plates on a swivel. But they're very kept sort of nice and eerie and, um, and sharp and angular and interesting looking. You put them in a dark room with no other sources of light and it creates a very interesting effect. Um, one of the other influences that uh, LaVey drew on very strongly, um, especially in his conception of what he called the Order of the Trapezoid, uh, was uh, the work of H.P. Lovecraft, um, specifically The Halter of the Dark, although there were other stories like uh, Dreams in the Witch House, um, Hypnos, uh, The Silver Key, that strayed into some of these same ideas of you know, mysterious, dangerous angles that allow certain things to happen. Um, so. The book by, by Don is actually a, uh, it's a collection of short stories uh, that he wrote that are all sort of in the Lovecraft vein, is one of his kind okay. of major influences. Um, and in typical fashion, it's you know, extraordinarily well written uh, and uh, coming from someone who's both a writer and a magician, you have this unique synthesis that you don't always find. Uh, you might find, it, you wouldn't have found it in Lovecraft himself. Lovecraft was a pretty much a staunch materialist, but it was very skeptical of anything along the lines of what we would call magic or, or the esoteric. Um, some of that may have just been influenced from his, his friend Harry Houdini, uh, who late in life was very, um, was a very well-known, you know, anti-occult crusader. Mm -hmm. um, so when you have somebody that, that actually is a magician, that actually does have some deeper knowledge of, of the occult or the esoteric, mm -hmm and is able to write about it in a compelling way, then you end up with a much more potent um, set of fiction than might otherwise uh, might always come about. And so that's um, part of what you get out, out of this book. And so it's a, very, it's, it's a very magical book, but it's also a very entertaining book. Um, and I think if actually put in, into, into practice in, in appropriate ways, it could be a very um, useful book. For people as well. So, Toby, you mentioned about music and how mm -hmm. you use music in your magical practice. Mm -hmm. Could you tell me something about that? Sure. Well, there are several different ways that um, music is a very potent aspect of, of magical work, um, both for magic and initiation. Um, there's the creative act itself, uh, which expressing something that's personal, that's unique about yourself through music or mm -hmm. whatever other art form. Uh, is, is meaningful to you, is very important. Uh, there's also, in the case of magical ritual work, of uh, choosing the correct music that heightens the atmosphere, that promotes the effect that, that you're going for. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's also uh, what I've practiced for a long time of music as a form of magical diary. So as you create music, you can lo uh, listen back to what you did you know, 10 years ago use that as, as a tool for recalling the, your emotional state, 
uh, what you may have been reading, what was going on in your life, how you've changed since then from the present day, etc. Mm -hmm. Similarly, as a musician might listen to, you know, listen to their first album, you know, several albums deep in the career and go, man, we, we, we had something going good there, but it wasn't fully developed yet, but now I can see where it came from, I can see what we were onto something then, but didn't quite know how to say it yet. Right. Uh, there's a concept in uh, the Vedanta, uh, which is one of the, the older sacred collections of texts within uh, India, uh, where they make a division between what they call causal principles, subtle deities, and gross bodies. And um, examples of what this would be, um, in the case of how I, I view this, um, you have what we would call the principle of isolated intelligence, or the principle of self-aware consciousness. Mm -hmm. Then you have particular subtle deities that are representations of that. Um, I think it's Set, Tezcatlipoca, Odin, um, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the gross body aspect of it would be like, for example, like a statue, a physical representation, a talisman that represents that. Mm -hmm. And th the looking at what um, a god or godhead might be in this sense gives you uh, a way to get to the philosophical core of what, what it's about without being so hooked up on the specific culturally defined representation of it that you may find resonance with. Um, the reason I bring this up in the context of, of music is uh, the creative act is one of those places where the the subtle deity forms of something like set of isolation of um, extreme individuality coincides with something like that of Odin, which uh, whose name ultimately means something along the lines of master of inspiration mm -hmm. or the font of inspiration. So taking this idea of uniqueness with inspiration, combining the two in the creative act uh, is a very potent representation of uh, what it means at its very core to be a unique individual essence. Um, and so the creative act then becomes an outgrowth of that, whether it's um, in, in art, you know, visual art, right. uh, music, writing, um, etc. Uh, and those who are both magicians and artists of, of any stripe mm -hmm. tend to intuitively know this, even if they don't express it in exactly those terms. So the, the types of music that I create for myself kind of fall into a couple of different categories. There's uh, one, the project name that I use called Miss Dreamt, mm -hmm. that uh, is more on the lines of electronic music. I take uh, field recordings, other found sounds, manipulate them in various ways um, to create something that you would you would probably refer to most easily as ambient type music, although okay. it's not meant just for background listening. It's sort of the ambient in the sense of the original meaning of the term, as uh, Brian Eno, who's kind of acknowledged as one of the originators of ambient music, described it as the, it can both be in the foreground or the background, depending on what you need to hear at the time. Right. Um, and so that, that music tends very well towards uh, using it as part of magical workings. Uh, in, in ritual forms. Um, the other aspect of music that, that I do, um, there's a different project under a different name uh, that's released as Eyes of Lygia, uh, Lygia being a reference to the, the Edgar Allan Poe story, mm -hmm. um, that is sort of what you might describe as ambient doom. It's not particularly metallic in the sense of you know Black Sabbath, right. but, but much more in the ambient vein, like um, doom bands like the Finnish band Skepticism, um, Shapes of Despair, um, others along those lines, where it it is kind of ambient in a sense, but it has guitar, it has a bit more structure, um, it has a bit more repetition as part of the, the ambience that's created, but it's still very much in the in the vein of you would uh, you would still sort of equate it with some form of metal. Mm -hmm. uh, um, even though it, it's a bit different from what most people would think of as the term. Uh, so okay. both of those projects I, I've used for several years. Um, the, the aspect of the Magical Diary I refer to factors into both of those as well. Uh, I've been doing both of them long enough that I can look back at some of the earlier experiments that I did with them and kind of hear uh, both what I was like at that time compared to now, um, as well as you know, they call back emotions, they call back memories, they call back um, just impressions of 
what was going in going on in my world at the time that they were made. Fascinating, absolutely fascinating. Now, so you uh, create music mm -hmm. as well, and I believe you have several albums. Is that uh, correct? Yes. Uh, that's right. Okay. Um, yeah, I believe the, the the bio that's posted on my page for the Left Hand Path Consortium um, gives links for a couple of them. Excellent. That's very fascinating. And so, uh, because I wanted to ask you, you know, how could um, we and myself possibly, you know, obtain this music? Um, I, for a long time, I've been a believer in. Um, Bandcamp.com is the distribution site. Okay. I like their kind of no frills model for how they let you uh, preview the music beforehand. You can mm -hmm. stream pretty much everything that's there. Um, you can buy it, whether it's purely a digital copy or um, also have the option of selling physical CDs, shirts, LPs, that kind of thing uh, through it as well. Um, so, as I said, the links for both of those are up on my bio page on the Left Hand Path Consortium. Um, Excellent. And. The, if the things that I've said today, especially along the lines of starry wisdom, kind of kind of resonated, then the the music may resonate also. Mm -hmm. um, especially with uh, Eyes of Lygia, it's more what the it does have vocals in it. They're sort of a, it was sort of like a like a ambient whisper in the background, right. um, as one friend described it. It basically sounds like your music is haunted. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, but the, the lyrics are very much in, in the starry wisdom vein that I was referring to earlier, heavily influenced by people like Lovecraft, mm -hmm. um, Stefan Grabinski, Hodgson, uh, Chambers, uh, people on those lines. Um, and attempting to, to convey something of the ideas that I've spoken about with starry wisdom. Uh, the, the Eyes of Lygia CD that will be coming out soon is called The Sidereal Messenger. Um, the, that title comes from the, the work that got Galileo in so much trouble. Okay. Uh, that's one of, um, it's not 100% correct in terms of the, his original Latin title for it, but it's a common translation of it, mm -hmm. and I like the, the meaning of it. Sidereal meaning related to the stars, and the messenger meaning something that is a messenger from the stars. Uh, connecting okay. with this idea of starry wisdom, of uh, providing this means of reflection, of uh, the leveraging that feeling of vastness and uh, an expanse that one sees when looking up at the night sky mm -hmm. and really feeling its import when the, the sky becomes an entrance, not a barrier. Right. Again, I'm Melissa Simpson and this is Toby Chapel, and I'm with the International Left Hand Path Consortium. I just want to say thank you for coming and uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Have a good one. Thank you.